Uh, my name is Marty Hurst. I'm a professor here at the School of Information. And I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Philip Guo. I have my cheat sheets here. Uh, he is giving a very, very interesting sounding lecture today. Philip is currently an assistant professor at the Computer Science Department at the University of Rochester. He got his PhD from Stanford in 2012. And uh, his advisors were Dawson Engler, Jeff Hare, and Margot Seltzer, although she's at Harvard. And <clears throat> come on in, everybody. And uh, his dissertation was called Software Tools to Facilitate Research Programming. But his research area, and he got his BS in EECS from MIT in 2005. So he's part of the new cutting edge of research right now in computer science and education. It's an old area, but it's newly hot. And I would say Philip is really on the bleeding edge of that area. For those of you who have ever used his Python tutor tool, I really wish it existed when I was teaching intro data structures. I dreamt of having a tool like that. And I would have loved to have had it when I was learning recursion as a student. It's really the tool that we need. And of course, millions of people use it online. It's quite an accomplishment. But not only is it a tool that's used for learning, it's also, as you will hear in this talk, I assume, <laughs> a laboratory for doing research to learn about learning. And Philip's taken it far beyond just studying how people program to innovate in how we study and do research about programming. Um, so it's a laboratory for learning about learning. Uh, Philip's also very well known for sharing, for sharing his thoughts about what it means to be a researcher and what it means to do research. And I, I know when I was a student, my colleague Marie Desjardins mm -hmm. wrote an essay about what it means to be a graduate student at Berkeley. But Philip took that to another <laughs> level and wrote a whole book about it <laughs> afterwards. So uh, not only has he done that, he writes regularly how-tos, like how to use Python, uh, IPython notebook to do uh, labs or to do basically work. And actually, I frequently point students to that. And he also writes other essays, like how to write a good HCI research paper, 12 tips for data-driven <laughs> research. So you could tell generally, he likes to give people hints on how to get things done, how, life hacks for researchers and so on. So I assume we're going to learn a lot from him today. Let's welcome Philip. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Marty. That was probably the best introduction I've had during this whole uh, talk tour that, that I've been given. So thank you so much for that. Um, and it's great to see all of you here. I've, I've met several new people here, which is awesome, this morning and afternoon. I see a lot of friendly, familiar faces that I've known from before. So it's, a, it's amazing to be uh, back here, because I spent uh, my family, we spent about 10 years here, uh, both at Stanford for grad school, and um, I was working at Google for a bit, too. So I feel I'm, a, I'm an adopted Bay Area native. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing the past few years on um, learning programming at scale. Um, Computer programming and data science are uh, now vital skills across a ton of professions. So I'm sure everybody here is, is well aware of this. So the most obvious uh, type of profession are software engineering jobs. So these are happening everywhere, all around the world. These are great jobs. You obviously need programming for that. Data science is uh, an increasingly important job role. This is uh, one of the uh, major job tracking websites. So the past five years, the role of data scientists has really been uh, has really been formalizing companies, even though people have been doing data science like stuff for many years. Even more broadly, in any sort of science and engineering field, people are now doing programming data science. This is one of my good friends, Kevin. He's an oceanographer, and you uh, you think he spends most of his time out in the ocean on these research vessels collecting data and doing science, but he tells me he spends maybe a few percent of his time at most out in the field. And uh, the majority of his time, he spent hunched over his computer in front of, the, uh, in front of a terminal in MATLAB uh, pre-processing, analyzing, visualizing his data. So scientists of all stripes are now programmers and data scientists. Even more broadly, journalism is now uh, being uh, infused with a lot of programming data science. So these interactive data visualizations and data stories that people tell on um, sites like New York Times and Washington Post, in order to make these, you have to have a lot of know-how about both programming and working with data. So given the importance of programming and data science, uh, the high-level question that drives my overall research agenda is how can technology make the current generation of programmers and data scientists more productive? And then also, how do you train the next generation in a scalable way? 
So to investigate this, this overall big question, I've spent the past decade uh, building and studying human-centered systems for uh, two main audiences, for programmers and for data scientists. And I further break this down into uh, experts and novices. So I, I started my research career as an undergraduate and a PhD student uh, working in the fields of programming languages and software engineering. So I built tools and did studies on how do you make uh, professional or expert programmers more productive in their work. And then as my, uh, it became time to start forming a dissertation, I was amongst one of the first groups of people to look at the emerging uh, population of data scientists as a, as a job role and empirically study what challenges they face uh, while they're doing their programming and then build a series of human-centered tools to help improve their productivity. So that was my PhD work. Um, and then I, after my PhD, I decided to move from the expert to the novice uh, uh, angle, uh, one, uh, one big reason was because I felt like it could have a lot more impact, because there's always going to be an order of magnitude more novices than experts in any field. Um, so in the past uh, year and a half um, or two years uh, since I've started my faculty career, I've been uh, doing studies and building tools to help uh, novice programmers. And the particular thread of research I'm going to present today, uh, I'm going to zoom in on, is uh, called learning programming at scale. And before talking about learning programming at scale, I want to talk a little about learning programming in school. So there have been decades of research um, and, and, and pedagogy uh, devoted to how do we learn better in school, both programming and, and obviously a lot of other fields. So in an in-person setting, you have high-touch interactions like one-on-one -on -one tutoring, where a tutor can help draw diagrams for you and really talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. You have a lot of pair programming and peer and collaborative learning in these lab settings. And then you also have one-to-many tutoring. So you have uh, situations where you have a computer lab and you may have 20 or so students and you have one tutor walking around monitoring, uh, gauging the classroom and, and helping out. So this is a, this is a topic that a that, um, fair amount of my colleagues are working on and still kind of improving the state of the art in terms of in the classroom. Um, but what really interests me is the fact that the majority of learners are not in school. So when we think of learning, a lot of times people immediately think of K-12 or college. But in fact, uh, the majority of people nowadays who want to learn anything, um, any of these skills are not in a formal school setting. So here's an example. This is Ms. Hamilton. Uh, she's 62 years old. She currently works as a document assistant in a law firm. So she's, uh, uh, basically a typist. And uh, she's one of the user survey respondents for some of my tools. And she writes in a part of her survey, I wanted to learn computer programming so as to establish a new career and have some independence. So this is someone who's over 60 years old, been in a career for a while, and wants to, to learn some programming skills to, to pivot her, her uh, career. But the most frustrating aspect of learning online is that I do not have a teacher on a face-to-face -face basis, um, such as in a classroom environment. And this has impeded me greatly. So this quote is, really exemplifies a lot of the, the feelings that people have about the current kind of online learning revolution. And it's that, um, and this drives the, the central challenge that, that I'm trying to address in this work, which is how can we scale up the benefits of face-to-face -face learning uh, to the rest of the world? So how can we take all these great things we know work well in person, but scale it up so that millions and millions of people around the world who are not in a school setting can still get some of these benefits? And I'm going to start with computer programming, um, because it's in itself, it's interesting setting its own right. And it's also uh, thinking about data science and, and the, the greater data science workflow. It's a prerequisite for doing a lot of data, data analysis tasks. Uh, but the ideas I'm going to present in this talk um, can generalize to other skills beyond programming. So after presenting each project, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can generalize these beyond just coding. The approach that I take in my research I'm going to present today is an exploration of a design space um, between kind of a trade-off between fidelity and scale. So on one end, you have a high fidelity interaction face-to-face. -face. You can see someone. You can see all their emotions, um, all this contact. But it obviously doesn't scale because you have to be there in person. On the other end is what people have been doing with the first generation of these online learning MOOC resources, which is mostly putting static resources online, videos, uh, digital textbooks, um, PDFs, uh, course materials. And that scales super well because it's online, but it's fairly low fidelity. You don't get that human contact. So the way I went about this work is I first, um, I first get inspired by best practices in face-to-face -face learning. Um, and then I want to design these systems for scale from day one um, to overcome the limitations of face-to-face uh, -face learning environments. I don't want to fully replicate them. And then I want to leverage that scale both to show efficacy of these systems I built and then also to inspire next steps um, in the project. An outline of this talk is going to be, uh, I'm going to first present a platform and then two systems built on top of that platform and then conclude with some future work. 
So before talking about the mannequins and the, uh, the stick figures, I want to go into a, a little bit of a theory about learning. So there have been decades of research that people in the computing education and um, educational psychology world have studied about why learning programming is hard. So, so for those of you in this room who have been programming for a while, it's often hard to appreciate just how hard programming is for uh, novices. And those of you who have taught can, you know, can personally feel this. Uh, my one slide summary to this is it's hard to summarize you know, an entire field of work in one slide, but here's one attempt to do so is that when you're programming as a novice, you're writing code. This is Python. You're typically writing a text-based language um, if you're learning, say, at the college level. Um, you're compiling, interpreting, or running that code. And that prints out some output to the screen. So it could be an image, but in a mainstream language, it's all text. So here there are three print lines, and then there are three um, lines of output. So a central challenge that all novices have to face, regardless of what language they learn, is that they have to build a mental model of what happens when the code is running. So they have to stare at that code that they wrote and the output that was produced, and they have to form a mental model. So this is a mental model for this uh, particular piece of code. Um, so there are three global variables, x, y, and z, and they point to five different lists. And if you trace this, it actually, um, it actually outputs the right thing. So, this is what novices have to do all the time. Um, this is great, except that it's completely wrong. Um, this is a completely faulty mental model of what happens here in Python. And it turns out that learners have all sorts of misconceptions they bring into computers, uh, com their first programming class uh, based on prior knowledge of things like mathematics, of how you know, equals work with math, or natural language, or even just folk knowledge about how computers ought to work from informal kind of informal folk interactions. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Sorva, did an uh, awesome dissertation where in the appendix he actually cataloged 162 of these misconceptions. And uh, the cool thing about these, I'm going to zoom in on too, is that he cited primary sources of the original studies that investigated these misconceptions. So here's two I'm just going to highlight really fast. One is that assignment moves a value from one variable to another, whereas you know, in language it copies. And the second one is that objects have a pointer to the thing that points to them, which is not true in, you know, in a mainstream language. Fortunately, there's a lot of research that shows that visualizations can help correct misconceptions. So if only there were a way to have someone draw a diagram for you of what is going on with a piece of code, then you can start looking at this and internalizing it and start forming the proper mental model. So this is the correct mental model for this particular piece of code. There's actually only two, um, two pieces of data, and they're shared. So uh, very briefly, the theoretical underpinnings of the systems I'm going to present from, uh, from literature are that the first thing is that mental models are foundational, um, that if you want to learn anything more advanced than program, if you want to learn software engineering or style or idioms or anything, you, you really have to start with understanding how some kind of machine works to, to run your code. The second one is that studying these visualizations can reduce the extraneous cognitive load on the learner um, because you see it right there, and then help start solidifying these mental models in long-term memory. And third is that it's useful often to first study these visualizations as someone else have written for you because you don't know how to create them yourself as a novice. And then later on, you can start maybe act, doing more active learning and drawing your own. So it's actually um, in a lot of areas um, like math and physics education. This thing called the work example effect shows that if you actually show worked out examples with diagrams, it, it helps learners first assimilate that information, and then they can do more active learning to be more engaged. So given that, um, human tutors manually draw visualizations all the time. Right? This, is, um, this is actually from Berkeley. Uh, I don't know if people recognize this particular class, uh, but this is an old Berkeley video from maybe 10 years ago. Um, humans obviously don't scale, so the question here is how do we scale this up? Um, particularly here, how can computers automatically generate these kinds of visualizations? Um, and to investigate this question, I've built a visualization platform here that I base other tools on. And it's called Rosetta. Um, it's more commonly known as Python Tutor because the domain I registered as Python Tutor uh, many years ago. I think John was there. So John and I were office mates at Google when, <laughs> when this happened. So it started as a Python only tool, but it quickly expanded in other languages. So I have a more language agnostic name for it. It actually supports a bunch of languages in different styles now. CNC++ are almost done. So essentially how it works is you write your code on the web. This is an example from um, the previous slide. You send the code to a server. The server does a bunch of technical stuff to instrument and run the code in a sandbox and, and ensure security and everything. It produces a runtime trace of everything that happened when your code ran. So all the data structures, all the stack, the heap, and everything. And it brings you to an interactive visualization. So this is the visualization for the example code. 
you can uh, press forward and then it'll run the code. So this runs the first line, x equals abc, and it displays the diagram. So this is exactly what a teacher would draw. Then the second line is what trips novices up, right? So what does y equals x means? Um, it's not clear if you don't know Python, but uh, if you run it, it just shows that they're pointing to the same list. So you can keep on running, and uh, the program output is here like a terminal. You can also go backwards. Uh, this, there's no magic here because all the program has been run on the server already, and this is just exploring the steps back and forth. So people find it very useful to go back and forth. The design point you want to think about here is I wanted to design the visualizations to emulate what someone would draw on the board. Um, so imagine, you know, you can imagine extending this sort of tool to make a debugger for, you know, 10,000 nodes or a million nodes or something. But for an educational use case, really the sort of what can you draw on the board or what can you fit in a textbook diagram is the, the design case um, for these visualizations. So I actually studied a lot of um, textbooks and also lecture videos to see the typical ways they, they render these, um, these diagrams. So I want to think about designing for scale, right? Because I want to think about creating one of these tools that actually scales and, and, and works with a lot of users in different settings. So there are a few uh, main high-level design points here. The first one is to leverage the open web. So because this is on the web, it's super easy to use. Um, also, I have no user accounts, um, no installation of anything. So um, because we're not collecting user accounts, we can't collect as detailed information about users. But it really, you know, having an account is a big impediment to usage. I mean, it probably cuts your usage down 10x or more. So without user accounts, you can just go on and, and just write code. Second one is there's this uh, shareable URL. So you can snapshot the URL at any given point in the visualization. This is the snapshot for here. The simple version is it actually just generates all the code and all the options. Um, you can minify it with a tiny URL thing if you want. The cool thing about this is that you can actually use it to say post in a form or IM or send it to a friend. And then they can actually see the exact same visualization and, um, and see your context. This turned out to have a nice viral effect because in a MOOC, for example, if someone posts one of these links, someone goes and helps you and they say, oh, this Python Tutor site is cool. I'm going to bookmark it and use it and send it to my friends. Another thing that we did was to have an embedding code. So this just generates some um, iframe and JavaScript code. So you can embed this, uh, this visualization in other sorts of web pages or uh, textbooks or MOOCs. So this, again, helps it spread a bit more. Another thing I did was to, uh, to ensure longevity, um, I have this um, modular graphics library um, in a way similar to D3, but kind of a higher level, kind of tuned for, uh, tuned for uh, data structure visualizations that allows you to add new languages uh, really easily. I don't have time to go into the details of that, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. And the reason why is that I didn't want this to be uh, just a Python tool, because like people have made these kinds of tools before that are one-off things that are just for one language. And then you know, Python's really popular for teaching now, but in 5, 10, 15 years, it may be something else. And uh, I wanted to make a generic framework that supports you know, a, lot of, a lot of languages. So due to this framework, um, you can really easily add new languages and custom data structure visualizations. Um, and I've, as an as a, uh, existence proof, I've extended it to all of these languages. And it's, uh, at this point, it's pretty turnkey to, to add more. Um, so questions you might have about this is, one is, how do people actually end up using this tool in the wild? Right. And second one is what value do people uh, find in it? So it turns out that this actually ends up, uh, end up having a really tremendous usage um, in the past three years since I've deployed it on, online. And a, a lot of this growth, basically all of this growth is organic. So there's about 15 million pieces of code visualized so far. Um, each time someone runs code and hits visualize, we count that as one and we log it. Uh, every day, just to get a sense of scale, there's 40,000 pieces of code visualized for about 5,000 users. All of this is naturalistic word of mouth growth. There is zero advertising budget. I, I cannot, I'm not a company. I cannot afford an advertising budget. It's just me at this point. So this has turned out to be all naturalistic. So it's really been driven bottom up by students. So it's been um, students taking these MOOCs who are doing programming classes. They found the service valuable, so they share it with friends and stuff. Um, people learning from Code Academy or Khan Academy, they post these and, and they really share this online. Even more than just pure numbers, what another interesting piece of data is just how diverse the user base is. Um, so far, there's been over 1.5 million users total over the whole span uh, from pretty much every country. So this is a, a diagram that shows a number of unique users uh, by, by IP address uh, by country. And you see basically every country is, uh, is lit up. I, did a, I had a user survey on the site uh, where people can self-report demographic information and opt into that. And it turned out that over half the users are 25 or older. So these are all people not traditionally K-12 
12 or college age. And a sixth of the people are 55 or older. So we really get this international and cross age and cross demographic span. And this, this will become, I think, uh, a really interesting platform for, for doing more detailed sorts of demographic studies in the future. So why do people find this useful? So again, based on server responses and clustering them, there are two high-level use cases that, that, uh, that came out. Um, so one is building mental models. So you can take a bit to read this um, representative quote. So this is kind of the idea of, you know, to really see what's going on step by step. And the second one is to debug code. So you could, it turns out people actually paste code in there from their programming assignments and start tracing it out and seeing what's actually um, going on. And, and instructors have also used this for particular use cases, but I think the majority of people using this are, are actually learners on the site. So in sum, what have we learned from this project? Um, the the high-level thing is this idea of surfacing procedural state, surfacing step-by-step step what is going on inside of the computer or any kind of device uh, is, is useful for both building mental models and also for, for debugging. Designing for scale made it into one of the most uh, widely used online learning projects in an academic setting um, with, with uh, you know, over a million users over the past few years. Um, and I think that in order to get this sort of scale, and otherwise you have to probably be at a startup or, or at a big company. So, so we're in this really unique position to be able to have this as a platform for deploying these more controlled learning experiments in the future. So if I, I'm talking to people in the learning sciences and at EdPsych who have specific hypotheses about how people are learning programming, this is like the platform for doing this because I have complete control of all the code and, and all, the, all the stuff. So we have thousands of users a day on the site. So in terms of the design space, where I would put the Rosetta system is here, is an improvement on these static materials of this idea of if you visualize step by step what's going on, uh, it's still automated, it's still fairly scalable, and we're kind of raising the fidelity a little bit. So thinking beyond programming. Um, so can surfacing procedural state help people learn other topics? So math and physics come to mind. So you can imagine math derivations or proofs or, or geometry or physical simulations. Uh, but what about something like a law? Um, so you know, legal briefs and kind of legal education is usually think of as textual, right? Just kind of blocks and blocks of text. But there's been some recent work that people have started thinking about how do we manually make some data visualizations to try to improve and, uh, and, and elucidate these legal briefs. So you can imagine something like con com combining NLP or crowdsourcing to help, help people understand you know, these kind of really dense legal concepts in a step-by-step -step way. The problem, though, is that I still haven't uh, started to fulfill the promise that I, I set out to, is that, that there's still no human in the loop, right? That it's great you have these visualizations, but people like Mrs. Hamilton still need to understand them herself. And it would be great to actually have people help her. So, you know, her original problem, frustration with the lack of human contact, is still not addressed, even though we're, we're exposing some state for her to learn herself. So to start addressing this problem, I developed a system called Coachella over the past few years, and I have two of my master's students help me run an online case study and data analysis for a, a paper we published last year. Uh, to get design inspiration for this tool, um, I did observations in our school's computer labs. This is pretty much like any computer lab anywhere, where you observe students working together. And naturalistically, people do a lot of pair programming and debugging. They do a lot of pointing to the screen. Uh, they kind of poke at the screen and talk about what's going on with each other. And then they also sometimes draw diagrams, because again, they're trying to understand what's going on under the hood. The, the, pro the computer isn't telling you. You have to actually draw it out on the whiteboard on paper. Again, how can we scale this up, right? Uh, In-person interactions don't scale. In particular, the question here is how can we bring these in-lab interactions that we observe to people who otherwise can't uh, meet up face-to-face? -face? Um, and to investigate this, I built a, uh, a system called Coachella, which is the first multi-user visualization system of this sort. So I extended the ideas of uh, visualizing procedural state to multiple users. So I'm gonna play a demo here. So this is the single user mode where you can write code and uh, visualize and, and step through it. And then if you want help, you start a shared session, you click that button. This is a unique URL. You can send this to your tutor who is maybe halfway around the world. So you still have to know somebody to send it to. And now you're synchronized. So you see both cursors. You see each other's cursors and clicks. So it's like you're present with multiple cursors. You chat with text. And then you can also uh, write code together, just like a Google Docs-like thing. And also you can run it as well. So 
So, um, so how do we design this for scale, right? So, so for starters, I just built this on top of the Rosetta framework, which has already been scalable at this point and, and widely deployed. And uh, the main additions technically were just adding real-time synchronization, multiple cursors, clicking, um, chat, just to make sure everything syncs up. Um, the sharing is just as simple as a URL, just like, um, just like using Rosetta itself. It's nice because there's no screen sharing software. There's, you know, it's as secure as your regular browser is. People, you know, you can just share one tab in your browser. You don't have to worry about um, kind of, you know, someone looking at your whole screen or, or at Skype. Uh, the multiple cursors are actually pretty good at emulating presence. People have shown this in other HCI work um, in, uh, in other uh, contexts in learning. And then text chat is more scalable than video, uh, both because of uh, bandwidth, right? Some pe people halfway around the world might not have enough bandwidth. Also, um, it's, it's a little lower barrier to entry to, to do. So if you're in a MOOC, you might be OK text chatting or participating in a perform, but you might not want to video chat with someone you don't know. The design point here is really one-on-one, -on -one, which is the one-on-one -on -one tutoring case I just showed, or a small group. So there's no reason why you can't have like five or 10 people join this session, but everybody's cursors are shown and everyone is like in one. It's as though you have people huddled around one computer with all pointing. So you probably don't want to use this for you know a whole class of uh, 100 people or so, but in the logs, we've seen people with five or maybe even more kind of collaboratively learn together. So the questions here are, uh, the primary one is, can it bring these in-lab interactions to people who otherwise can't meet up face-to-face? -face? Um, and the second one is, can people actually learn anything <laughs> by using this interface? And also, can they feel a human connection, right? I mean, can they somehow emulate what they're getting in real life? To evaluate these questions, um, we did an in the wild deployment because we really wanted to answer these questions in the wild with naturalistic data of how people are actually choosing to use it rather than having a lab study that says, oh, you must use this uh, because then they'll obviously use it. Uh, so we added this to the Rosetta website uh, for about a year and a half. It's actually still on the site. The data is from um, a few months ago. Uh, there's a shared session button and that was it. There was no advertising, no um, there's no uh, advertising or payment. This is just a tool that's up there that the existing pool of users who are already learning online can choose to use if they want. So this kind of, this kind of sample are people who are voluntarily naturalistically using it. So what did the data show? Um, it turned out that people did use it with remote collaborators. So it turned out all, uh, over 700 sessions were created in this time span. This is all real sessions, not just a spam or someone you know, entering and exiting. Um, they span hundreds of cities, uh, dozens of countries. The interesting data point here is half the sessions are multiple city ones. So the IP addresses actually were showing people lived in different places. And one six were different countries, actually. So this is a graph that connects two countries. If some session that people joined, they were from those countries. And uh, because this data was all anonymous, I don't have detailed data about how these people knew each other. But I suspect that they might have been taking an online course together or posting on a Stack Overflow or some kind of help form. Um, and the open challenge, the obvious one for future work, is how do we actually group people together and pair people? So as of now, it's a, merely a conduit that people have to still find their own tutors. People interacted like they would in labs, so uh, based on a chat log analysis of how people interacted, uh, we saw two main forms of interaction, um, a pretty even split. So there's a one-on-one -on -one tutoring case where there's clearly a tutor who was helping someone. This is just showing a tutor's quote. So this is a really good tutor who is, um, you know, you hope all tutors are this good at uh, kind of Socratically refining the question and trying to help them uh, debug and then uh, generalizing. Uh, the other case was peer learning, which it felt more tentative. So A and B are two different people. You can imagine three people or more. They're kind of going back and forth, running the code, asking each other, is this right? Is this right? Let's, let's do this. And a lot of these peer learning cases, it seemed like they were trying to like do homework together or do a uh, programming assignment there, just like they're kind of uh, scribbling on paper. Uh, people, in fact, uh, did show signs of learning, uh, often by discussing visualization. So again, because this is all a uh, chat log and data analysis, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't control for learning in a lab, right? So we can only code for indicators of knowledge transfer. Uh, to get a sense of how long these sessions were, the median was 42 minutes. So this felt comparable to someone sitting and actually helping you out rather than like three minutes, you're on Stack Overflow, you answer a question, you leave. Um, there were about a three to one ratio between interacting with the visualization, running code, interacting, and chatting. So by coding the chat logs, we found both main kinds of knowledge transfer at the lower three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy is a six level hierarchy that kind of increases in sophistication of learning with kind of creating novel research or knowledge being at the very top. So you can, you can think of this roughly in the programming terms as syntax, semantics, and uh, transfer, applying what you learn to a slightly different problem. And we saw 
all three of these. And often the, uh, the, the knowledge transfer was anchored to the visualization. So this is a representative quote from, uh, from a tutor. And you notice from reading this quote is that this is really talking about the details of how something is running, references and pointers and shapes and everything. If you only had, say, Google Docs or a, a code editor, you can't talk about this because you don't actually know what's going on inside. So the visualization, the key point here is that the visualizations really mediated the knowledge transfer. Um, a side thing that we found also from looking at the chat logs, even though we weren't originally looking for this, is a lot of signs of emotional bonding. Um, so there are these effective emotional exchanges that often promoted or appear to promote motivation. So there's friendly banter between friends. There's signs of camaraderie. There's encouragement. So here's a, a learner who was discouraged and a uh, tutor who said this, right? So there are a lot of cases of these things coming up. And we, we see this in um, computer support and collaborative learning. Um, there are many other, many other uh, colorful quotes. We see this in computer support and collaborative learning of the importance of actual uh, keeping motivation um, in an online context. And I think this is what kind of separates out having humans from just getting a robot tutor from a machine. So what have we learned? Um, that a substrate for discussing procedural state, for actually talking about what's going on step by step, uh, can be useful for those who can't meet in person. Um, but also, interestingly, in a third of the sessions, we found that Coachella was used even by students taking an in-person class together. And uh, we, we coded for this by, sh by seeing for when they mentioned some in-class context, like uh, I think a fair amount of people were probably taking John's class. Uh, I, won't say, I won't say what they said about John's class, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, there was a fair amount of Berkeley usage here, um, 61A. Um, and and you know, they're talking about, oh, let's go get a pizza after this and stuff. So it's interesting that they chose to use this tool even though they could have very well um, uh, met in person. And there's this idea, classic idea in HCI called Beyond Being There, and talking about uh, thinking about interface design that's actually, um, that people would prefer to use even if they could be there in person. So this is one kind of example of this. Um, and I think the theory here, uh, my hypothesis is that people liked having that, that visualization and, and talking about it. Even if you're in person, you'd have to draw it out, or maybe use it in person. Um, and these effective exchanges really uh, do go toward humanizing online learning. So one of the bigger themes I want to explore in future work is, you know, what separates us from just having AI just teach us everything? And I think this humanizing aspect is really important uh, for keeping motivation. So in the design space here, what Coachella tries to do is push out from the face-to-face, uh, -face, right? You're lower fidelity. Uh, but you're, you're a bit higher scale in the sense of you can have more people connect. You don't have to be co-located. You can use this, say, in a MOOC. Uh, at thinking beyond programming, um, can synchronize procedural state, can, can this idea of if you synchronize your state and talk about it, can they foster um, real-time critiques if you're doing an art or design studio? So imagine sculpting or, uh, or weaving or other sorts of physical tasks. Can you instrument the environment? So can, you know, how would you teach this in a MOOC? Right? This seems pretty hard. Uh, maybe you can instrument the instructor's environment, the student's environment with cameras or some lightweight instrumentation so you can see what people are doing in the process and then start commenting on and talking about process. And I think, uh, I think these ideas can, can generalize. Uh, there's a lot of challenges beyond the programming space, but I want to you know, brainstorm this in the future. OK, so after working on Coachella and deploying it and seeing the data, the, um, the obvious problem that arose is that there are much fewer tutors um, than learners in any context. So this is Ms. Hamilton again. So imagine if she's in a MOOC. She's now happy because she can summon help from like a TA. So if she summons uh, a TA in, or a tutor in the MOOC and says, oh, I need help on this particular topic. Can you help me? They can go in and do a one-on-one -on -one chat with her. And, and she's really happy. And she gets this nice tutoring interaction that she's been craving. Problem is that for the TA, they're probably overloaded because they may have five or 10 other people like her who also want help, right? That um, right now, the interaction for the TA is you, have to, you can only help one person at once. And if you want to help five people, you have to open five windows or tabs and switch between them. So it's not really optimized for the tutor as much. Um, the, the tutor's attention is really the bottleneck here. If you want to scale up uh, learning and scale up humans, the tutors are much rarer than the, uh, the learners. Uh, so the question here is, how can a single tutor help uh, more people and more than just one person? Um, so for that, I built a follow-up system that uh, I published at WIST, um, uh, presented at WIST a few months ago. It's called CodeOpticon. So again, I went back to the lab to do observations. And this time, I observed the tutors in the lab instead of the students. So this is a typical lab situation. And uh, what the tutors want to do when talking to them is that they want to provide timely and targeted help. So student raises their hand. They go up to them right away, ideally, and help them exactly with their, the problem they're having. Um, 
by doing that, they have the exact context, right? And, and everything's fresh on their minds. They also want to provide proactive help as a best practice, which means if they see someone squirming or stuck or frustrated, they want to be able to go up to them and politely nudge and say, you know, do, do, you, do you need to step back or do you need help for a minute? Uh, this is really important for novices because oftentimes either they don't, uh, they're too shy to ask for help um, or they are too stuck or fixated debugging and they don't know that they should step back and ask for help. Um, so this is the ideal, right? If, you're, if anybody who's taught in a lab, this is what you want to do. But as you know, the reality is, is way harder, right? There's 20 to 1 ratio, 50 to 1, you know, John has 2,000 to 1 or something. There's way too many people in the lab. And this often turns into a best effort scramble. And it's something that, that people don't appreciate unless you do this. It's physically exhausting <laughs> to do this. Uh, you, you have to run around for an hour. It's really hard. So how can a single tutor help more people at once without uh, as much fatigue? Um, it would be great to make a tool for tutors uh, in the lab, uh, but I want to think bigger, right? The, the central question here is how can we scale this up beyond uh, our classroom? So I want to make something that's generic enough to not only work in a lab, but also work in an online course uh, like in a MOOC. So the solution I came up with is called Codopticon, and it's the first uh, one-to-many real-time tutoring interface. So basically how it works is you have a tutor here in the middle, and you're monitoring simultaneously a bunch of learners. So it's like a virtual room. Um, so I'm going to show a simple case where there is one uh, learner and one tutor. So here is uh, the learner's editors on the left and the tutors to the right. I'm going to play this video twice. The first time, look on the left side, and then look on the right side. This can be used, with, in theory, with any code editor. I've implemented on top of the Rosetta or Python Tutor framework, because that's my framework, but it could, it's pretty generic. OK, so someone is writing a product function in Python. X and Y are the arguments. And I know they want to do A and B. And uh, how do you do product? You use X, because that's the multiplication sign. And then when you print, it gives you uh, an you know, unhelpful error, right? And then you, you don't know what to do, so then you make a lowercase x. These are based on real errors. Uh, OK, so same video again. Now look on the right side. So the tutor sees the learner's edits um, nearly in real time in these chunks. So it's green to show addition, just like a diff. Uh, and then green again, another chunk. So red, that flashes, shows deletion. And then green again. So as a tutor, you just only see what's on the right. You just see a tile. And then when they try to run the code, you see the error in the line right away. And then now what the tutor can do is use a slider and actually go back in time. So this is a history slider. They're all in chunks, roughly by token. So you can actually see what the learner was doing, the errors they're doing. And then if you want to help them, you can start a chat in line. And that will pop up just like the Coachella thing. It just has an inline chat box. Um, and they now can have a private one-to-one -one chat. So in this way, you can provide this proactive help. Right? So if you're watching someone and seeing they're struggling, you can decide to intervene uh, if you want. Um, you can also imagine a learner calling the tutor, but we haven't implemented that uh, yet in this first prototype. But it, it should be pretty straightforward to do. So uh, this is one tile where it summarizes the learner state in real time. Uh, so how does that work with a lot of learners? So the, the interface here is actually we just uh, grid the tile. So this is a, just a web interface. This is 10 tiles. On a desktop monitor, you can fit 15. Um, obviously, we're not expecting a tutor to watch all 15 and 10 people at once. No one can actually do that. But we want to provide an interface so that you can see everybody coding in real time and use the history slide to go back. So you kind of get a holistic sense of the room or the virtual room. And then you can hone in on specific people who need help. So designing for scale, the first thing is that this, again, works with Rosetta or any web-based environment. I mean, you have to add a little code to the other end, but it's actually pretty lightweight. You just need to stream information, um, edits, and chats. Uh, the history slider is actually a really important design point because you can't possibly see everyone coding. So it, the user study subject, they actually just went back and forth just like slightly to see what people were doing um, in the recent past. You can start any chat. Any of these boxes is a private one-on-one -on -one chat. So you can actually start multiple ones to, to chat discreetly with individual people. Um, and then the big question here is what if there are more than 10 or, say, 15 people? So I don't have the time in this talk to go into it, but there's this dynamic tile reshuffling algorithm that 
the basic intuition is that when you have 100 people, say, in a MOOC or an online course, not everybody is coding all the time. At some times, certain people are coding or getting errors, and other times they're idle. So um, there's a, you know, it's a fairly long tail distribution. As you use periodically shuffle around people and float the more active people to the top. That's one first order approximation for, for activity. Um, it's not a perfect heuristic, uh, but it works reasonably well to guide the, basically the tutor's attention to people who are most recently struggling or, or making errors. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is about what does the student see, right? So the student actually sees, uh, the tutor is, you, you're, you want to think of it as, in a way, they're, it's virtually like the tutor sitting right next to the student. So they should see the exact same thing. So for code, they can see exactly what they've been editing in their current code. So if the student is writing code, it'll show up in real time. And then for the visualizations, uh, because this is on the visualization platform, actually, there is uh, a stepper here. I didn't talk about it because I wanted this to be more general, that if you, you're on another environment without visuals, you can't see, but you actually can see the step. And the student sees the, the same view. But it's mostly useful for like coding related things. So you can just think of it, one model is someone comes up to you virtually next to you. And the cool thing about this is you can come up to multiple people at once. So questions here are, uh, the big one we started with is how many learners can a single tutor actually handle uh, in, a, in, a, in a live situation? And uh, can they actually help people uh, doing this? And then how does it compare to uh, real life experiences of real life tutoring? Um, to investigate these questions, I did a, a user study that was uh, both in the lab and online. So I'll tell you what I mean. So each subject was one tutor. We brought them in, eight of them, one at a time in front of the computer with the, with the dashboard, with the code opticon. This was the entire staff from the intro uh, CS to Python course at, at my school. So uh, these are exactly the people who are in the tutor audience. These are people who are doing lab hours and, uh, and helping students. Even the instructor does lab hours uh, as well, as well as all the seven TAs. This is their first time using the system, so I've never seen it before. Um, and I just, the prompt was, I had a little introduction, but I said, spend 30 minutes helping these anonymous learners on the Rosetta website in whatever way you feel most comfortable. So again, I wanted to see naturalistic usage. There was no reward for like, you need to tutor X people. Just do whatever, I said, you know, pretend like you're in a lab and just do whatever you would normally do in lab, however comfortable you feel. You know, you get paid regardless of what you do. The online learners, uh, the terms of service here, you know, they knew they had their banner saying, you know, if you're on the site, you, your stuff is all being logged and you consent to being logged if you use it at this time. But they didn't, weren't expecting the pop-ups at those times because for a simple reason that there wasn't a tutor most of the time. So um, they couldn't actually ask for help. It was purely proactive um, on the part of the tutors. And this simulates sort of the, uh, the customer service experience if you're at a shopping website. And it says, it looks like you're looking for these pair of shoes. Can I help you? Uh, unsurprising, a lot of people said no and you know, closed the box. And we didn't bother them if they closed the box. Also, because the learners came from dozens of countries, they, they may not have spoken English either. So they might have, you know, the, the results here are probably numbers wise are probably low on the lower end. Um, and this simulates a worst case scenario, right? That in a real deployment of this, if I had a MOOC or an online course, the tutors would know how to use the system well, and the learners would um, sign up for like the tutor's office hours and, and know about the system as well. So, um, so how do they do even despite this sort of um, kind of first use scenario? Uh, because the focus is mostly on tutors, I focus on uh, doing a think aloud and interviewing them. Uh, in general, they, they observed about 200 people a session, 52 at once. So the dashboard had about 50 tiles on it at once. Um, this seems like a reasonably high number. This is about the number that you get in a MOOC, because even though MOOCs have thousands of students, not everyone's online at once. Maybe 100 people are online at once. Um, this is 30 minutes, by the way, a 30-minute session. Obviously, they weren't looking at all 50 at once. They were selectively attending. Um, the one big thing that stood out, um, which was mostly nonverbal, was immersion. Is that pretty much everybody went over the time limit? Like, you know, I set a time limit for them. I told them we were done, but they, everybody went over, and I let them go over for a bit because I was interested in seeing how they would do. So, you know, nobody wanted to stop, with the exception of like one or two people. Um, they didn't show any visible signs of fatigue or overload, even though I didn't, you know, I didn't strap anything on their heads to see that. But uh, they, uh, you know, they ended up basically scanning and selectively attending to particular people who needed help. So this is not a complete solution, right? You can't help 250 people at once, but if you can help more than you could if you just had no interface. 
Um, the other thing was this report of authenticity. So everybody felt like they, uh, after getting in the groove for a bit, they felt like they were tutoring in real life, even though this is clearly a very low fidelity, low bandwidth interface. Um, there are true personalities in style shows. So some people said that in real, you know, I, I talked to them afterwards. Some, some people were very reluctant to tutor. They didn't really jump in or they're very hesitant. And they said that in real life, that's how they would do it. They wouldn't want to jump in or be, and other people were like really gung ho and they like ask everybody. Uh, and they said in real life, that's what they do in the lab. They would rather be more upbeat and, and proactive. How did it compare to in-person tutoring? Um, Three main advantages that the tutor cited was the main one is that you can control your own pace, is that you are no longer um, being pulled in all directions in a physical lab. You have a dashboard. There's this kind of feeling of a, an internal locus of control. You feel, I'm in control of this. I can help whoever I want at my own pace. The history slider they use all the time, and they felt that was super useful just to go back in time. And the answer to the number question is they can help about three people at once. So this is a chat number of chat windows open um, at once. Um, this is a misleadingly high because a lot of them were open, but they weren't chatting. But usually they, they were slow to start up, but they got to about two or three at once. So that's sort of the number that, uh, that you would expect because I, you know, it's hard to imagine someone helping 30 people unless they're really fast at typing, unless they're a chess grandmaster or something multitasking. I mean, people, our brains are still pretty limited. But the idea here is that you can help someone, and they have some lag time. And, and in doing so, you can jump to other people and really uh, multitask that way, which you can't do in real life. Disadvantages is the main one people complain about is that the text was too low bandwidth. Right? You can only provide little targeted pieces of help. You can't have a great one-on-one -on -one dialogue. We're trading off quality for quantity. right? Because you can see more people, you can't like have a video chat with everybody. Um, the other one was related to the algorithm, the heuristic we use for shuffling people around. And some tutors were, I mean, we don't have uh, actual evidence of this because we don't have know the learner side, but they were concerned actually for, after the study because they thought some of these people at the bottom I wasn't paying attention to. Maybe it's because they actually were stuck and needed help, but there was no way for them to like call me for help. So, I, you know, in a real classroom, I would see that someone is visibly frustrated. But you know, unless we strap something on everyone's heads or have eye tracking, it's hard to tell. Yes. Oh. Um, that's a good question. So about the first system. Yeah. Yeah, so I, the first system, I, uh, I remember we looked at all the chat logs. I don't remember that being an active complaint. But then again, we didn't survey people on that. So I think the first system was more we're taking data that people already are giving. So they didn't actively complain about it. But you know, I'm sure if we surveyed them, they might have raised that as a, as a concern. Right. Oh, this is the, sur the tutor side. Sorry, this is not the learner. So the tutor complained about this. So in person, the tutor was like, oh, I wish I could have talked more with them. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. That's right. And there's no visualization as well. That's right. Uh, you know, Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So Baron's Bjorn, point is absolutely right. It's that the Coachella, the first system was higher fidelity, right? That uh, you have a, sh a visualization that you both see. You're both seeing the exact same thing. You have cursors, you have clickers, and then you're talking with text. And you're, you're I mean, as Paul's point, like you're only doing one on one in the other case. Whereas this case, you really just have, it's actually really small, right? I mean, the tutor sees like a, oops, the tutor sees just a little box that's like tiny. So yeah, and they have to multitask. Um, and they don't have the visualizations. So that probably contributed to it. Um, but we couldn't really comfortably fit visualizations on there because where do you put them? Because uh, there's so many of them. Uh, yes? Do you think about the tile view gets you the overview, and then you zoom in on demand, basically dropping people into the Coachella system? Yeah, so, uh, so I guess to repeat the question of the mic. So, so Bjorn's question was you know, thinking about having this 
tile thing, and then if you really care, you zoom in, and then you get the high bandwidth one. And that was actually some of the user study people, um, even though they didn't know about the other system, they suggested that um, as a, I wanted, so some of the people, what they said is that, I wanted to, you know, after I found the two people I really wanted to help, I wanted to zoom in, and then maybe like push out everybody else in like the perimeter, so I could still see them, in a maybe even more compactified view, right? That I could maybe see just one bit of information, whether you got an error, so that, um, yeah, so that's, a, Clear next step, but for the current, you know, first incarnation, we didn't we didn't do that. But the technology is all there, right? That we can connect it up. Cool. Alrighty. Can't read people, just let people raise their hands too. That's right. So so the other way is, you know, in a real deployment, people can just ask for help, um, so that we don't have this in the first deployment because there were no tutors. So if I had a professional bank of tutors, they could raise their hand or virtually raise their hand. Um, the raise their hand thing is interesting to, to perhaps study in the future because you know maybe people are less shy about raising their hand if they know it's anonymous. Whereas you know in a real lab, people don't want to raise their hand because it's it's in person. So we could actually get beyond there. Uh -huh. That's right. And the, the other extension of this, since we're this is really good brainstorming, is that uh, what if you have multiple tutors, right? So if you have a staff of 10 TAs with 1,000 students, you know, how could you multiplex and have a queue of, you know, put yourself on a queue and the first TA helps you, or the TAs who are most loaded, we don't want them to help you because they already have four people, and how do you display a multiple TA case? Um, Right, or pulsating or something. <laughs> Flashing red, pulsating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that goes with Bjorn saying of you know both actively zooming in or just passively. You know the tiles. You know it's like a tree map thing. The tiles get a little bigger when they're more active and pushing the inactive ones. Yeah, so I think there's all sorts of cool layout things to do. The simple one is put a grid and move the <laughs> move the grids around. Cool. Um, so in person, and the disadvantage is this uh, uh, reshuffling thing, which we, there's many ways to think about improving. Okay, so how did the learners react? So what about the other end, right? So the other end was obviously much lower fidelity because these are anonymous people on the site. We don't know them. Uh, we could only look at their uh, chat logs. So it turned out that in every session, on average, two or three people actually confirmed that they got help, um, which uh, despite the fact that these are unsolicited pop-ups. So um, I think that in a case where someone was asking for help, this would probably be a higher number. This is interesting because uh, this is a fairly high bar because it, it means that we need someone to actually say thank you and, oh, you fall, solve my problem, I like this uh, thing, or can you stick around later? Uh, uh, you know, we had some cases where we suggest that, that one of we, the, the user study subject suggested something and it looked like the person fixed a bug but they didn't actually talk back or acknowledge so we didn't want to count those. So this is actually acknowledgements. We did again a chat log analysis and this time there were uh, a knowledge transfer at the lower two levels. So simpler sorts of knowledge transfer. So here are some high level examples of what people were uh, appearing to be teaching to the students. So a lot of these the themes are kind of runtime debugging, submit code semantics uh, sort of things. That's about the level that, that we're thinking about working with here. Okay, so to wrap up this project, what have we learned? Um, this is the first uh, time that people are trying to, th we're thinking about doing one to many. How do you scale this up in real time? Um, and they, could, they can monitor a few dozen people and help about three-ish at once. Uh, they found this experience immersive and authentic and even preferred it over the in-person lab tutoring. So we had several people tell, tell us, you know, I want this actual tool because I don't want to, you know, Rochester's super cold. So, you know, we don't want to trudge through the snow to get to the lab. I want to actually be able to tutor in my, own, in my own dorm room and help these students out at, you know, all hours of the night. Um, it's again kind of getting to the beyond being their point um, that they would like this interface even though they could just go to lab and, and see each other in high fidelity. And here, the, the point I want to make also is that surfacing the process history, what's going on step by step um, in time, um, it makes it easier to monitor multiple people at once. So like if you just had a dashboard with all this data deluge coming in real time, we're not going to do very well. And just a simple act of having a slider and chunking up these changes just helps people uh, be able to scale their attention a little better. Yes? Yeah, so this is a Beyond Being There. So this is a classic uh, paper uh, uh, by Jim and uh, Jim Hall and Scott. This, they were at Bell Labs, is that right? You see, it, but back then they were, I think, Bell Labs, maybe. Yeah, it was, a, it was and the, the argument they were making in this uh, paper was that we should strive to make interfaces uh, 
computer-based interfaces that people would prefer to use even if they had an in-person interaction. So, you know, the kind of zeitgeist in the classic HCI days is in-person is the best, and how can we strive toward getting closer and closer in person? And their argument was, you know, we should strive to make interfaces that people would prefer to use even if they could sit there in person. Uh, like an ATM. Like an ATM. <laughs> or a chat. I mean, chat is a great example of that, that people prefer to chat uh, even if they could talk in person, because chat has these nice uh, asynchronous and you know, semi-anonymous affordances. Um, so check that paper out. Um, okay, so in design space here, what code Opticon tries to do is push this out slightly more. So I think people's questions have gotten at this point that uh, the fidelity is going to be lower, uh, but we're going we're gonna to try to trade that off for, for a bit more scale. Thinking beyond programming. So what if uh, everyone could watch everyone else all the time? So what if everyone had a code Opticon to watch everybody else? Um, the people who are teaching in this room are cringing at this, uh, <laughs> this idea. So would this be chaos or would this be actually interesting? Um, my wife is a dentist, so she actually did her training at UCSF just across the bay. And uh, this is actually the UCSF dental lab. They have these basically 100 pods of, uh, and rows where they have all this equipment and all these computers. And they basically have row instructors walking up and down the rows supervising. And the students are milling around helping each other as well. So it's, it's one way of kind of these, these kind of studio or medical environments where people are all watching each other work and serendipitously helping each other. And can we design these sorts of interfaces online? And I think the cool thing is that online we can do better because uh, we have history and we have all this implicit information that we don't have in the physical world. So big question here is you know, how do we scale up medical education online um, seems seems like a, a giant challenge I don't know if you want your surgeons training from a MOOC but maybe um, okay so last problem here at, in this series is that what if there are no tutors right so both Coachella and Codopticon presumed that somebody's available to help you uh, but in many settings online uh, nobody's available as a tutor you're learning from a MOOC or, or from a online materials you're reading yourself so if there are no tutors I'll talk about some ongoing and future work the only people who are here to help you are other people who are learning on the, on the site at once. So this is some traffic data from the Rosetta, the Python Tutor site. There's about 60 people simultaneously online. It spikes up and down with time. A MOOC has around, I would say, 100 or so, order of 100 people at once. Because again, time zone, not everyone is signed on at the same time. So this is an interesting crowd of people because they all have a shared context and you know, more or less shared expertise um, and some kind of a shared motivation because they're all trying to struggle and learn. So how can we actually use them to help each other? So this is kind of an emerging field called learner sourcing that some of my colleagues and I have been, have been promoting. So in the programming space, um, one idea that uh, I, I got a, a Google, a recent Google award for is uh, to create step-by-step -step tutorials. So this is an idea that one of my undergrads helped me prototype is that you have a uh, piece of code, like you just ask something about what does this code do, you know, what's the semantics? You farm this out to the crowd. So instead of using Mechanical Turk or a, a paid platform, you farm it out to a, uh, to a crowd of people on a site, like a MOOC or my uh, Rosetta site, where people are actually learning. And they're, they're, you know, solving different problems, but they're doing some programming. And you have them actually run the code because we're surfacing all the internal state. They can run the code and label the, the lines of, of code. They can also, we can also think about labeling data structures. But for now, they're labeling lines of code. So you can use usual crowdsourcing techniques of voting and aggregating and filtering to try to get the crowd to prune down uh, these annotations to make a nice kind of set of uh, basically try to make a tutorial for step-by-step -step what's going on in this code. And with some initial pilot studies, it turns out this actually works reasonably well for simple code. Um, they can actually do you know, explanations that are comparable to what a teacher would make for very simple code. Um, and you know, there are a lot of challenges here. How do you do this fast? How do you do this reliably? How do you do this with complicated code? There's one way of kind of harnessing the power of the crowd to start explaining something to, uh, to novices. Another way you can use the crowd is to actually have them help each other. So this is the um, NSFCRII program, that uh, I, uh, a grant program that I, I got in its inaugural year. So this is a new early career faculty award. Uh, it's a, they call it the pre-career. It's like the thing that you get your first two years before you apply for your career. And a part of that award, my proposal was about um, activity and skill matching. So again, you have this crowd, you have all these people, they're programming, they're doing something, but can you 
suggest matches or you know suggest people who might work well together because you can track what they're doing online and uh, and model maybe their skill or their errors. So. You know, toy example here is, oh, it looks like you're struggling with linked lists. You know, would you like to work together, Bob or Kara, who are also struggling with linked lists? So I think there's, there's a ton of open questions here on, you know, in, in a social system, how do you make this actually socially amenable and have people actually want to help each other? Yeah. I really like the crowd idea, but maybe I missed the point. Um, what's the motivation we're using the crowd for simple scripts? As programming languages are formal languages, you probably can just automatically generate the step-by-step -step tutorial running the results and um, have some partial yeah. execution. Um, so what's the motivation for including the crowd? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about, um, you know, can you imagine automatically generating, you know, automatically running the code and just generating an English? Yeah, I guess in this case, the explanation is fairly simple. So that you can generate English from this. So, so um, uh, Marty and, and Bjorn and Andrew and other folks have done work on thinking about how do you write templates and automatically generate these explanations. Um, the, the thing that the human gives you is that actually it gives you this sort of higher level view of why this code is running the way it is or, um, or uh, tricky things like, uh, what's an example? Yeah, this is a simple example here, but um, on more complex examples, it's you know things that aren't exactly apparent from just the surface details of the code, um, or you know, trivia or gotchas or, or things. So yeah, so I think in the base case, it would be you can automatically generate, and you can even imagine starting with automatically generating examples and then having people augment or create them. So this is the you know having auto first and then having humans help. Um, but I think the humans do have insights that is hard to glean in machines. Cool. So some of these ideas that I want to pursue in the immediate future about using the crowd, what they do is they push out again more and more, right? So instead of one to many, you have a many to many situation where again, it's lower fidelity. These are not experts. These are often other people learning and tutoring each other. So it's quality's not great, but you're pushing out the scale more. And in the future, um, we're hoping that these sorts of ideas percolate to things like MOOCs and online learning environments so that people like Mrs. Hamilton don't have to just be stuck with uh, one particular uh, modality, right, of uh, just face-to-face, -face, uh, uh, either face-to-face, -face, which she doesn't have, or just static material. So she has this gradient of things that, um, that, that uh, she can choose from. So, uh, before talking a bit about uh, more future work, including, I want to just try to answer this question, right? So the question I set out to answer um, and the approach I took in the work I just presented is to, uh, by surfacing procedural state, what happens step by step, and then also some of the history, and then fostering this environment where you do real time monitoring and chat. And uh, a more tweetable way to say this is to, to surface invisible, uh, then talk about it. So this is a super simple idea of just talking about something, but you need to have some artifact to talk about. And oftentimes when you're programming, the state is invisible, so you have to somehow get it up you know, on the surface and uh, talk about it. So I think this can work in other fields like art, design, medical education, even something like law. So these ideas, I think, generalize. Um, Thinking even more broadly, as I hinted to before, this is an awesome platform now for actually running learning and, and, and cognitive science experiments at scale. We have millions of users, you know, thousands a day, every country, every, you know, pretty much every country, every age group, all this data. Um, and thinking about what experiments to run is, uh, is a really cool, um, cool concept. So here's some just high level brainstorming. Uh, one is I'm interested in cognitive models. So people have done classic work in cognitive modeling in the lab or you know, from a very you know, theoretical or very low level perspective. But now we have all this big data about how people from vastly different backgrounds all over the world are learning and struggling with this really cognitively complex task. Um, so I think there's some interesting scientific findings we can get from this data. The other one is, uh, could be interesting to, to people here who like arguing about programming languages, uh, is that everybody has religious wars on which programming languages are features or paradigms or hard to learn or easy. Uh, we can replace ideology with data uh, now. That we could say, you know, we can put up different variations of the same concept and see who struggles more and where are they struggling. And we can start answering these questions that have traditionally been thought pieces and opinion pieces. We can actually start answering it with hard data. Even more broadly, uh, I think we can take advantage of with our international user base is there's over 180 countries. How many languages are people speaking in this? Uh, we did a simple Google Translate experiment with some of the chat logs and code logs. At least 50 or 60 languages showed up. Um, 
So uh, how do people, uh, how do human languages affect how people learn programming languages? This is something that no one has been able to explore because no one has had this data. People have all thought about, you know, all this pedagogy is English centric, right? All this stuff is people writing in English, but what about people in all these countries who are clearly wanting to learn programming? They have to learn English first to learn that, or they're trying to code in their native language. I think there's, you know, both this and the cognitive models. I think there's a lot of stuff with different cultures that uh, we can investigate that we just haven't been able to without this data. So to wrap up, I want to go zoom out one more level. So uh, I've done learning programming sale, which is this slice right here. Uh, but the clear quadrant that needs to be filled in is this last one. And this is um, another third of future work, uh, which is really relevant to a lot of the data science excitement here, is learning data science at scale. So I want to go back very briefly from my dissertation work. So I, I was one of the first to characterize and formalize this workflow of how data scientists work. So there's data preparation, uh, which takes a lot of pain and tedium. There's a main analysis phase where you're editing your scripts, running your scripts, seeing some graphs, and then debugging. Uh, so this is you know, the debugging loop when you're programming. Then you move to a reflection stage, right? So data science is about reflection. It's comparing different outputs to each other, taking notes, holding meetings, and reflecting and exploring alternatives. So this is the outside cycle of the iterative process of data analysis. And then when you're done, for some definition of done, when your paper is due, or when your report is due for your manager at a company, you write reports, you may deploy your experiments online or also archive or share them with other people. All right, so um, this is a kind of a high level view of the process. What my PhD work was on was conveniently uh, building tools to fill in all those boxes, <laughs> very conveniently. So uh, the papers that I wrote in my PhD dissertation were about tools to help data scientists cope with the challenges in, in these phases. And uh, I love to talk to people more about these tools all day. Uh, that's a whole other talk I give on that. The current work that I've been doing the last few years has been learning programming. So where does that fit in this uh, and this diagram. So programming is right here. It's the central loop, right? You have to know how to write scripts, understand them, run them, and debug them. Uh, but clearly, if you're the best programmer in the world, you still probably cannot be a good data scientist unless you can do everything else. Right? Data science is a lot more than just writing some code and producing some graphs. Um, there's all these other phases. And uh, in future work, I want to think about how do you learn data science at scale. So here's some, some high-level examples. So, uh, can use visualizations to um, kind of visualize uh, unclean and, and, and semi-structured data to help people start learning how to assess data quality and how to clean data in an interactive way. Can you do visualizations to help people eliminate misconceptions about statistics or how to apply statistics or how to interpret data results? Because without this output, you're, you're not going to know what your results mean. So this is a really hard thing. I don't exactly know how to do this, but I have an intuition that visual tutorials and interactive tutorials can help in this regard. Um, and this is, I think, the central challenge to data science is what do you make of all, this, uh, all these graphs? And then when you're done, can you use the crowd to critique diagrams? So visualizations is uh, what Marty's been doing, uh, working on, or uh, abstracts or data stories? Um, can we use other learners to critique it? And through it all, I want to keep leveraging the scale I already have with this platform to create these add-on tools to you know, go from Python to data analysis to Excel or to these other things. And we can actually just keep pushing it on this platform and, uh, and experimenting with new interfaces. So to wrap up, um, this audience of software engineers, data scientists, scientists, journalists, and programmers, um, this, this audience of people who have to do programming data analysis is only going to grow more and more in the next few decades. Um, and it's a super important audience. And, um, and given this ever-growing demand for uh, these two skill sets, um, how can technology help train the next generation of programmers and data scientists um, in a scalable way? And this is, uh, this is kind of the question that's kind of in the back of my head that, that kind of gets me up every morning and going to work. I think there's a ton, a ton of work in this. And I've, in this talk, I've only shown one sliver of you know, the beginnings of this, uh, this journey. And I think there's, there's so much more to your time. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take, uh, take more questions. Hey guys, for questions, if you could speak into the microphone, this is for our online audience. It doesn't magnify the sound in this room in any way. Great, great. thanks uh, for a great talk, Philip. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what needs to change here as you move from programming to other domains of knowledge. 
because I mean, programming has a, this very specific epistemology where you know, I mean, it's very, it's possible for you to map from lines of code to the procedural state yeah. because there is, you, you know what the true procedural state mm -hmm. is, right? I mean, the, the, the mapping between those two is very deterministic. If you wanted to use this general approach for understanding the rhetorical argument of a legal document mm -hmm. or of a political debate or of, of a data science pipeline, where those boundaries are a lot fuzzier about what counts as being true and about what even the, the general concepts are. What, how, do, how would you approach that with this? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the question about generalizing beyond something that has a you know, absolute ground truth, right? Everything has an absolute diagram. I think the way to think about scaling that up would be um, you have to involve people, I think. So the, uh, you know, the stuff with legal or political discourse, you have to provide these interfaces where people can chat or make annotations or, you know, or put little notes on that and maybe vote on it or have an expert vet it and stuff. So I think it's, unless we solve AI, I think it's really hard to automatically say, this is the right way you should analyze your data. And we probably don't want that because you know, AI is biased too, right? Whoever designed the AI to say this is the right data visualization, or this is the right legal argument, they have the, the creators have their own biases they, they inject into it. So the way I would think about that is less of the automated generation and more of the providing a platform where people can write things and vet each other um, so that's my high-level intuition on that, is involving the people more. Um, so you have a lot of anonymous data in Python Tutor. Yeah. I'm curious what kinds of different research you would enable if, hypothetically, all this data was tied to specific people. Yeah, so the question is about, you know, the data is now, uh, for privacy reasons and for scale reasons, is all anonymous. Um, so what can we do if we had people, data about people? The direct way to go about that is actually if I were able to teach my own MOOC or, you know, run a boot camp or a, or a mini MOOC, then we would have data about students and their, um, both their demographics and also about their learning outcomes, right? So I think the extra thing we would get with tracking students more fine-grained is we'd actually be able to make stronger statements about uh, learning because we can actually say, okay, they actually, people who struggle with this but then got this intervention actually did better on this test. And, uh, you know, of course, test results are not the best indicators, but it's something. So I think having, um, and also the other thing about having people data is you can do longitudinal studies. So maybe someone is learning this year, and then they're taking another class next year and the year after. So imagine a four-year program. You can make uh, a longitudinal arguments there. So I think there's a lot to do, and I think the way to bootstrap that is to, to run my own course or an online course. All right, so um, just to just to throw out a particular problem in teaching programming that I don't think is quite addressed yet. It's a, one, of the softer, uh, one of the softer concepts, and that is that recursion um, is, although you can use the, uh, the sort of Python tutor mm -hmm. um, visualization, that's a very, very bad visualization. You don't really understand recursion if that's the way you see recursion. Mm -hmm. Instead, you've got to learn to make these recursive leaps of faith. And I wonder if you have any insight into how that particular concept can be, can be taught properly. Yeah, so the recursive Or visualized in particular. Yeah, yes. so that's a great question. So um, one alternate kind of visualization for something like recursion or functional programming in general is to think about visualizing the, uh, the code itself, right? Because right now I'm visualizing data blocks. So you can imagine with recursion, you can imagine something like when you make a recursive call, it actually like... I don't know if you want to do a zoom in box model, but it actually shows the same code maybe or substituted in with, you know, the same code is repeated and it's substituted in with, you know, the concrete values and you do that several times. Um, I think my intuition here is having multiple representations may be helpful there. So you have both the, the memory state and then also the fact that the code is folding in or um, like a substitution model. So for more functional languages, um, you can imagine uh, here's a piece of code and when you recurse, it actually substitutes in the next call. Um, but I think that's a really domain specific thing that we have to, to look into. Um, and, uh, and the general question here is how do you do functional programming concepts? And I think imperative, these state diagrams are more for imperative and object oriented languages. Learning functional concepts like Haskell, you know, like lazy evaluation Haskell, there may be different kinds of uh, diagrams you need. Hey, so I, I was wondering if you thought any about uh, using these tools to understand third-party libraries. So just as an anecdote, a few days ago, I used a Python library where I passed in some data structure, and it returned some other data structure. And then later, I looked at the first data structure I passed in and noticed that it had mutated it. Oh, without yeah. telling. So I'm wondering, you know, it would be interesting, and it would be an interesting way to explore the way a library really works and what it does. 
Yeah, so the question is about uh, can you use this to probe into how libraries, you know, third party libraries work? Um, I think in theory you could. I mean, this thing itself, when you import a library from the standard library, it just uh, it steps over it, right? It only, the focus is on the code you're, you've written yourself. But you can imagine extending this to step inside the library or even, yeah, to show what's going on. And you can imagine doing a diff or stuff. I think this is a general question about scaling up to larger code bases. So you can imagine this as a tool for exploring APIs. So, yeah. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, in Rosetta, I'm assuming there are some programs that people have shared much more than others, like some particularly highly, highly shared ones. Um, have you looked at that just to see what it is that the aggregate pool of all of the world's learners finds most interesting? That's a really cool question. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, the data, I'm sitting on this <laughs> growing and growing pile of data that I have not had time uh, to analyze. But, uh, you know, Given, you know, if I have a student who has that exact same question as you do, then that, that would be an awesome question to answer. But yeah, the data is all there. I have not uh, dug into it. I'm curious, a lot of the examples we've looked at seem to focus in on like these very small uh, programming examples for learning a specific concept. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to see how this might be used or has been used for more project-based learning where you, you need to understand, you know, 100 lines of code they've already written and just maybe the way they've organized their functions isn't the best decision or, um, and so it's something where you might need to have a longer term relationship between tutor and student or you might need to just pick up on more information about their project before you can be an effective tutor. So I'm curious yeah. to see how they've done, how these tools have been used for that or your, what your approach to that would be. Yeah, that's a great question about um, kind of project-based learning the next step. So then kind of the, uh, one of my intro slides, I, I was showing how the scope of this work is really on found mental model foundations, right? That you have to learn to walk before you, you run kind of thing. And these small CS1 sort of examples what I'm focusing on. And the stuff that you're talking about is really, once you have a basic mental model, the next thing you do is the 100 lines of code or the someone gives you a piece of code that's big and you have to modify it or you have to work with the team. My intuition there is, the, uh, the visualizations may not scale as well for that. And what you might need for that kind of mentoring situation with, a, like you said, a longer term relationship is an environment like this, but for um, facilitating pair programming or coaching. So imagine a web-based development environment where someone can add notes to your code or start a discussion about your code or record what tests you're running and have a longer persistent session. Right? So imagine you have a private tutor that goes into your session every uh, day and you ask them for help and they, it's more like a critique thing where they kind of critique your code you're writing or answering questions. But I think the, the design will look fairly different. But I think that's the obvious next level of complexity. So I'm thinking about 10, 20, 30 lines of code and you're in the 100 to 500 lines of code range. So it's a great, that's a great design point, yeah. Hi, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, it, it was very interesting. Um, I, a couple of questions that, that come to mind, though, um, is that in a way what you've described, and it's something we have heard earlier from MOOCs, and huh? then people back away, is massive participation. And as you said in response to an earlier, you, you have no real sense of what the outcome is, whether anyone has learned anything. And I wondered equally whether you had any sense of whether your hunches about the process are vindicated. Um, ideas of mental models go back to very early cognitive science, which has had fairly strong critiques for a long time, that that isn't a very good view of how people learn. And also your two extremes of the one-on-one -on -one versus the scale, there's a lot of work being done on learning in small groups, communities, and mm -hmm. practice and the like, which seems not to be accounted for here in some way. So I, I wondered if you could you know, give what your own qualifications to what in some ways is a counting of how many people participated, but then we, <laughs> then we slightly yeah. fall off a cliff with what the implications yeah. of that participation so I'll take, so are. So there's two parts of the question. The first one is about, you know, uh, how can we tell in an online setting where people actually retain their knowledge, right? That, that, uh, how can we tell if people learn anything and retained it? And the, the way we've done so far was, uh, yeah, we, we only have indicators from these chat logs that you know, they solved their problem, their media problem, they, some knowledge was transferred from one party to another, and they solved their media problem. Of course, because we're trying to do this at scale, we can't track them 
uh, we don't actually track them and you know hunt them down a week later and say oh did you remember this thing um, and, and you know in general kind of one of my views is you know retention even in an in-class setting is poor in a lot of settings right you you learn the stuff for the exam and afterwards a year later you might not be able to retain um, so I think that the the learning aspect uh, the second part like the second part of the first question on mental models is um I think that in this particular case of visualizations of mental models, there's been a fair amount of uh, computing education literature that, that kind of backs up this intuition and that people have been using in person uh, for quite a while. So it is true that I'm transferring that to an online setting, and I have not done the f uh, field experiments to empirically test that, but that's on the immediate like future work of the first part is, you know, these things that uh, people have done these visualizations in the classroom and shown that they have had some learning benefits. And I want to at least replicate that in an online setting. And this, the second question was about uh, the community, for, uh, yeah, the design space, right? The, uh, the design space, I just had a simple two-dimensional model of uh, fidelity and scale. And that design space has been mostly about just thinking about one person learning, like Mrs. Hamilton. So there is a, you can imagine a third dimension of social. There's a social dimension you know, that juts out a third dimension with collaborative learning and a community of practice and forming professional identities and such. And um, I think that, in general, the online learning world has not been super good about that at this point yet, that we're still trying to figure out uh, as one person learning, how, how can we improve that? Um, you know, you can imagine extending some of these systems that I already have to start forming small group identities that people are already on this platform learning together. So uh, if we can have cohorts, so, so one of the things that's worked in some smaller online courses is this cohort effect that we are all, you know, people with a certain background, we're getting through this together. Um, one specific, I don't want to take too much time, but one specific example is my colleague Mark Guzdow at Georgia Tech. They try to do online learning like this, but they have a really specific use case, which is how can we train math teachers to become computer science teachers in K-12? Because it's hard to get people who, it's hard to get uh, computer science graduates like many of y'all here to teach high school because you could make 10 times as much money at Google. So in order to get K-12 computer science teachers, you often have to retrain math teachers. So how do you do that at scale? You do it online, but you need to provide a community of practice and high touch interactions, moderated form, so they feel like they have a cohort of other math teachers around the country like them getting through it together. So there are people in that social space, but um, that's not my particular expertise on that. But yeah, that's a great third dimension to, to hopefully add. Okay. Right. See our last question. Okay. Uh, so there's been some work in uh, MOOCs identifying uh, kind of modal states that uh, learners fall into yep. and starting to learn to program and ways of sort of scaling the instructor's feedback is to you know, provide feedback for those modal states. Have you thought about applying something like that idea to code Opticon yeah. so you could scale it past you know, 10 or 20 Yeah, users. that's a great question, Zach. So, so Zach's uh, observation is that there's been kind of work on people mining data from programming traces and trying to categorize, you know, bucket students into they're really stuck or they're an explorer or they're, uh, they're uh, you know, they're really active about, uh, they're unafraid to make mistakes or they're very pensive or careful. Um, yeah, so I think the code Opticon, the monitoring dashboard, we can easily, we have all the traces so we can easily apply some of those to help scale up the tutors because you have 100 students or learners and uh, you can imagine automatically grouping them together so that you can scale up one tutor's feedback or just warn, you know, have an early warning warning system and say, typically in the past, you know, when we've seen this data in the past, someone is about to get in trouble now and uh, you might want to intervene. Um, so yeah, I think that could easily plug into the system. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you all.